I will start with a song as it is customary for me to do always before I speak before a group of people. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Most High God, the God whose I am and the God whom I serve. Blessed be his holy name forever. I exalt him, I lift him up, I praise him, I worship him, I honor him, I speak his truth and nothing else. I fear nothing but him, for he is my strength and my shield. He is everything to me and everything that is. He holds the world together by the power of his hand. He's the Lord, he's the Lord of the universe. He's the Lord of Nigeria. He's the Lord of Africa. He's the Lord of each and every one of us. And I give him the glory today before anything else. Glory and honor and praise be unto him forever and ever. Amen and amen. amen. May I begin with the protocols. I first recognize the chairman of this great occasion. A great man. A man that has done so much. Not just for... Anambra, but for the entire country, Nigeria, and the man that we love and we remember with the greatest fondness, and somebody that was a good friend, a younger brother to my late father, and we love him very much, and that is Governor Jim Muobudu. May I recognize the guest speaker of this occasion, the former president of Sierra Leone, a man that has spoken with such distinction and such a high level of intellectual quality today. And I'm really impressed by what you've said, sir. We've learned so much from you, and I'll say a few words about, if I may, about what you said today. We welcome you, sir. May I recognize the governor of Anambra State, ably represented by the deputy governor. May I recognize the governor of Imo State, ably represented by my good friend, the former Minister of Education, Mrs. Viola Onwelleri, looking as beautiful as ever. May I recognize you, madam. May I recognize my big brother and the man that has been such a stabilizing force in my life. Every time I have any kind of small crisis or challenge, I go running to him, and he has never closed his doors to me. And you, you, you all know I've had many challenges in my life, and he's a great man. And that's Senator Ben will be doing a good. God bless you, sir. May I recognize my friend and brother, Governor Ohakim, who is here today with us. A good friend. I, w I was with him, on the, if I may say so, I was with him on, the, on his last day in office um, when he was about to leave, packing all his bags, and he still found the time to see me, and we had a long discussion about what was to come. And um, everything he said that day to me in the confines of his office and his home came to pass over the next eight years. So he's a man that is gifted with a, a very high level of the prophetic. And um, I commend you, sir. Thank you. May I also recognize somebody that's so important today, and that is the First Lady. First Lady at the beginning, First Lady at the end, First Lady always, the beautiful Mrs. Nambi Azikwe, whose husband and who is our father and her husband were coming to honor here today. May I recognize the Royal Fathers, the great Opi of Onisha, a good friend to the former Oni of Ife and the present one, a great friend to the people of the Anago, the sons and daughters of Ududua, a great friend to Nigeria, and a great traditional ruler, and the most paramount one in the whole of the Eastern Zone. I recognize you, sir. I recognize my father, the father of all of us, because I am now your son, sir, given the fact that I'm married to your, to your daughter, and that is the Azuzu of Oka, and all the other traditional rulers that are seated here today. May I recognize the Vice Chancellor of this great institution. And there are so many people, with all his team, the directors, the bursa, and um, the professor of the, of, the, of the law faculty, who I can't see because I'm blocked by a beautiful lady. May I recognize that? I recognize you, madam. And each and every one of you. Look, it's, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to be here today, to, be, to have been asked to come and say just a few words, and I'll try and be very brief. Um, and, you know, I'm touched to the marrow 
And when I first got the invitation, I was a little bit apprehensive that, that does my big brother really want me to come here? I may say some things that might be a little bit harsh and inflammatory, um, because that is my nature. I believe that it's important to speak truth uh, always and um, let God do the rest. Um, but he had the confidence in me, so I'll try and be as restrained as possible. <laughs> I'll never invite him anywhere again. <laughs> no, we're, we're, on safe, we're on safe territory, sir. I assure you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it, it, it really is a humbling experience to be here. And let me, let me just start by saying that it is befitting, and it is a great thing, a good thing, that an institution like this has been named after such a great man. And, I, you know, I really do, I really do wonder sometimes because I'm sorry to say this, even the people of the Southeast themselves, I have to say this, do not fully appreciate up till now what they had in Zeke. You see, Zeke was a man that didn't just make his mark in the Southeast. He didn't just excel here. He didn't just use the platform of the Southeast and become the president of the country. It wasn't as simple as that. Zik's whole legacy started long before then. And it's a testimony, it's a testimony of the power of unity and love between people from different ethnic backgrounds. That's what he represents to me more than anything else. Zik would have been the first premier of the Western region. Because Zik was as much a Lagosian as he was anything else. Zik was a man that lived in Lagos, that grew up in Lagos, that was voted for in Lagos. <coughs> and when the great Herbert Macaulay, an Anago son, a son of Odudwa, I don't use the word Yoruba for a number of reasons, but an Anago son, who passed on, he, he created, in my view, probably one of the greatest political parties that ever existed, and that was the NCNC. That's Herbert, uh, that's, um, Herbert Macaulay. And on his dying bed, on his dying bed, he handed over the flag of this great party to Zeke of Africa. And he said, you will lead from now on. And the man now, and, and Herbert Macaulay now died, and Zeke took up the baton. And what did he do? Zeke went to elections in the Southwest, regional elections, and he would have become the first premier of the Western region. I think it was just a question of carpet crossing, very complicated issue. I will not go into it here because it will create all kinds of problems for me back home if I say the wrong thing on this. <laughs> but the facts are clear. The facts are that more or less, I think it was 10 or 11 people from a party called the IP, Battle People's Party, crossed party lines and voted with um, the action group. And that is how Zeke was edged out. And he now made, you know, made that famous phrase that, I shall go back to the East from whence I came. And he went back to the East. And you see, it was a domino effect. Because when he went back to the East, the next thing that happened, a man in the East, by the name of, I believe it was Ayo Eta, I'm not sure. I, I hope I didn't get more eminent historians here than I. Um, he was premier of the Eastern region at the time. But when Zik came back, he was literally brushed aside. And the people of the Southeast, and particularly the Igbo people, supported him for that position, and that's where it all started. He became Premier of the Eastern Region from whence he came. And I think that in itself was a bit of a tragedy for us. Because if it had been different, if we hadn't looked at it the way we did at the time that we looked at it, um, and I'm saying, I'm talking about those from my part of the country, perhaps things would have been very, very different today in terms of integration, understanding, and so on and so forth. So, this legacy was remarkable, remarkable. And I, and I have to say this, Ma, that, you know, when I met him, I think it was in 1991, 92, uh, we were on campaign with the lady, Umar, uh, Umaru Kafi, his Choice 92 campaign team, and I was a special assistant. And the first thing he said to me when um, I was introduced was that, do you know that your grandfather taught me at school? I said, really? I was shocked. He said, yes. I said, sir, I didn't know this. He said, it's the truth. That when I was at school in Lagos, your grandfather was my teacher. And that is, uh, my grandfather's name was Victor Adida he, he, he went on to Cambridge. He went on 
to become a, a, a criminal lawyer, and then he became the third Nigerian appointed as a judge. In those days, we had uh, English judges, but he was the third, na the third Nigerian. So, but he taught at the I believe it was MBHS. I'm not sure. Methodist boys. That's right, MBHS. He taught him, and he told me that your grandfather had a profound impact on me, and I will never forget him. And I felt really touched by that. Somebody else told me later that when he came back from the United States after getting his degree, they did a big, the Igbo State Union did a big dinner party for him in Lagos. And they invited my grandfather to be chairman of the occasion, and he gave a keynote address welcoming Zig back home. And that was, that is the level of attachment and commitment. And that is the level of understanding that my family from two generations back have with the great Zeke of Africa. Now, quite apart from that, and I'll be very brief, it went further. My father, who was in Action Group from 1953, and uh, he left Action Group in 58, 59, he went to join the NCNC. And Zeke graciously, in my view, offered him the most powerful position that the NCNC could offer anybody in the Southwest at the time. You have to understand that in those days, the Southwest was split down the middle. NCNC and Action Group. It wasn't a question of one side dominating the other. It was literally 50-50. And my dad was appointed as the leader of the opposition in the Western Region, Western House of Assembly, and he led the NCNC team, and he you know, stood against Action Group who were on the other side of the parliamentary aisle. So he worked with Zeke. So my father worked with him as well, just as my grandfather knew him and mentored him and stood by him. And I'm very, very proud of that. And, and, and there is that element of attachment that I have. But quite apart from all that, quite apart from all that, look at what he did. And look at an ideal that we all shared. Some still share it, but not all. But at point, one point, we all shared that ideal. A united Nigeria, where every individual, regardless of tribe, regardless of faith, stood as an equal where everybody could aspire to be anything, regardless of where you came from, what your faith was, even who your father was. If you have the education, if you have the understanding, the wisdom and the knowledge and the courage, you will be able to aspire in that old Nigeria. Yes, there were issues here and there, but generally speaking, that was the principle on which our founding fathers established this country, fought for independence, won it. There were issues that came to fore almost immediately. And you know, you're, you, you are more familiar with this history than even those of us from outside the East are because you suffered it. And I think it's very important that anybody or anything that happens in the past that has led to a high level of trauma amongst our citizens and our people, trauma on the part of those that were oppressed and murdered and subjected to genocide, and trauma on the part of those that did it, those of us that did it to them. Because trauma comes on both sides. This is something we cannot and we must not ignore as if it never happened. We had issues. And those issues started familiar what happened. Everybody knows what happened. I don't need to go into that. It's very, very upsetting to talk about it. But we can't brush it under the carpet. We had issues. And those issues ended up in July 29th, 1966, 300 Igbo officers were slaughtered in one night, including an Igbo head of state. Yes, before then, January 15th, 1966, there was an earlier coup. And about 20 prominent people were killed that night. Brutal, terrible, and acceptable, including pregnant women. I would never subscribe to that. My father was the only one. They came to our house. And the man that led them is still alive. He's from the East, and I've made contact with him, but they came to our house, they took my father out, beat my father in front of me, I was six years old, and took him away. But by divine providence of the finger of God, my dad was saved. So the point I'm making is this, I have every reason to hold on to that and say, we can never forgive, and not only can we never forgive, we will never forget, and whatever happens to those that did this, they deserved it, which is...